Hi and welcome to this an overview of Project Highball. As you can see, these are two bouncing bombs bouncing down locks driven in 1943. We spent a week in 2017 looking for, doing surveys and ultimately lifting two of these bombs. And this is, as you can see, locks driven and uh, some of our team actually on the lock. Here you've got some of the highballs on the bottom of the locks, you can see, and our team lockside getting ready for the fun. So we should perhaps start this video with a little bit of background to what Highball is all about. Back in 1943, Lock Striven, up near Glasgow, was a very good place to replicate the conditions of the Norwegian fields. The Navy, the RAF and the Army used Lock Striven as a secret testing ground for a number of different weapons, including the X-Craft submarine, uh, underwater chariots and Wellman submarines, as well as obviously testing the, the highball bomb. The highball was a variant of the upkeep bouncing bomb uh, using the same technology. Effectively a central drum full of explosive with a steel outer shell that allowed this bomb to be dropped from over a kilometre away from a, a floating target and bounce above uh, torpedo nets down to its destination and then using the reverse spin on the bomb hug the side of the target ship and explode underneath the armour belt. The lock stripping was used to test we believe over 200 of these bombs and our job was to identify the location of those bombs, survey the site at some level of detail and ultimately recover two bombs for display in museums. The majority of this secret activity in lock stripping was aimed at perfecting a mechanism to attack the Tirpitz. This is the sister ship to the Bismarck. She was moored up in the Norwegian fjords and was terrorising the northern fleet at the time, impeding supply operations into Russia and really causing the Royal Navy a bit of a headache. The highball bomb had been developed alongside the dam buster bombs using the same technology but with a specific target of, of dropping it uh, against ships. Now the highball bomb, although not actually used in the Dam Busters raid itself, did play uh, an important part in the film. The original Dam Busters film in 1955 used footage taken on Lock Striven of the highball bomb in the film to depict the, the bombs bouncing towards the dam. So there's a, a, not only a technological linkage between Dam Busters and highball, but uh, also quite a significant film-based link as well. Our aim with this project was to identify, to map and ultimately to lift two of these highball bombs so they could be presented to two museums. One of which was the Brooklyn's Museum which houses the Barnes Wallace collection which has an example of every other bomb except for the highball bomb in its collection and of course then our second one was the de Havilland Aircraft Museum the home of the Mosquito, the uh, aeroplane that was used to uh, drop these highball bombs. So what follows is a little bit of a flavour of the expedition to go and do all of this. Look, and I'm about to put the hammer down. So as you can see after a, a long journey up to Scotland we put our boats out on the water we left them there moored up for the week and uh, used them as our base of diving operations. You can see here 
Uh, this is the first of our uh, project dives, just to get in and have a look what there was and do some initial view by eye of what there is down there in the lock. You can see we've already put a shock line in down to the large anchor, uh, which is visible on a, on a sonar, and use that as the, as the kind of cornerstone for our search from there. As you can see, it is rather large. It transpires, however, this anchor is actually nothing to do with the highball project. We originally thought that it might be something to do with anchoring the target ship, but as things turned out, the type of anchor that it is, which is a Bruce anchor, wasn't actually made until 1974, so we could rule out the anchor and indeed the chain from anything to do with highball. It, it is actually quite useful that it's there, that said, because it, it offers a really useful datum point for going and seeing the rest of the, of the highball uh, debris field. And also, now we've put in a dive trail and we've published it, it will allow other people to go and see this. And it is an interesting feature to dive on, because you can see an extremely large anchor. You can see here from the size of the diver compared to the anchor, it was, it was a fairly hefty bit of kit. So this particular dive, starting at the anchor, is following the large anchor chain out to see what we can see. Now, we, we did know from earlier work that there were likely to be highballs reasonably close to this chain. So our dive on this occasion was obviously looking from side to side to see what we can see. And if you see just ahead on the right, a little shadow in the gloom, this is the first highball that we actually saw on our trip up to Scotland. And as you can see, remarkably intact, sat on its side in the silt, some rocks and other bits of, of uh, material around it, but largely a, a very, very well-preserved bomb. This particular bomb is actually one of the bombs that were lifted and came back to East Chester Tobacco Club for onward donation to the museums. And as you can see, there is a little bit of marine growth around it, and as we found out when it was lifted, a, a fairly big layer of concretion, but it, it's very, very obviously a bomb. As you can see my colleague here uh, taking some notes uh, and doing a drawing of it. As we proceed further along the chain, we came to a, a little group of, of three bombs. The middle one in the picture here at the top, you can see has got a very significant dent. This evidently hit the target, uh, this one the chain I talked about now, and had a very large dent in the side of it. So uh, that was one that clearly hit where it was supposed to, although whether the damage would have impaired its function, uh, we're not entirely sure. Now, swimming out from that group of three bombs, about 15 to 20 metres further out and towards the shore, again, in the gloom, you can see a shadow emerging. This is what was a, a surprise to us, an X-craft side charge. So one of those midget submarines used to carry two side charges, one either side, and these would be bolted to the side of the submarine, as you can see from the, from the shape of, of, the, of the unit here. These were bolted to the side of the submarine and contained two tons of explosive, the idea being that the submarine would find its way through the uh, torpedo nets and uh, under a target ship, and by releasing some bolts inside the submarine would be able to deposit we believe a pair of these charges onto the seabed before retiring a safe distance and, and uh, initiating the explosion. In this case, this one looks as if it's been hit by a trawl net or something, because clearly there's some damage on the, the top corner of it there, but uh, nonetheless, a very impressive piece of equipment. They're about eight metres long. One thing we did think about was that the high balls have been certified by the Royal Navy as explosive free. These had not been certified as explosive free, so as you can see while we're swimming around we're taking great care to leave them well alone and not, uh, not get very close to them at all. So we also conducted a jack stay search, a bit more of a, a structured search with a guide rope. 
This is some footage taken from uh, a remotely operated vehicle that joined us. You can see here the jack stage search line uh, suspended above the bottom of the lock and obviously the, the ROV kicking up a little bit of silt with its propellers. Uh, the team basically would follow this line and then move the shot to either end so uh, effectively take a large chunk of, of the lock and be able to systematically search it. And the team did find uh, another side charge using this method as well as a number of highballs. As you can see conditions are quite challenging as the ROV kicks up the silt which is very easily done reducing the visibility to near zero. So in addition to the diving that we were doing and manual searching, we also engaged the services of a few bigger and better equipped friends, including Aspect Surveys, Klein Systems, GSE Rentals, who gave us a team to use the side scan. All of this allowed us to produce a really detailed side scan of the lock. You can see from this particular scan as it moves down the screen, uh, we've stopped it now to show you, but this is the debris field of the highballs. And you can use the software to zoom in to a particular area of interest uh, and take some measurements of particular detail. As you can see here, we're zooming in to this area of a number of highballs. And there's one in the middle there particularly that we can zoom in on and, and do some measurements. And this is using the software to effectively calculate based on the size of the shadow and the size of the uh, return image, uh, the size of, of the particular target, in this case clearly a highball. And the software also gives you detailed positional information as well. Now in addition to the side scan survey, the survey team actually returned uh, with their ship with a 3D bathymetry survey rig and produced this rather fantastic three-dimensional view of our survey area. You can see from this the depths of the lock from the shallow in the red at the right hand side down into the purple deeper area which is 60 or 70 meters deep. This is uh, showing you the, the kind of area of interest as we zoom in. Uh, this is as you can see at the top left of the screen where the cursor is pointing. That's the chain and the debris field of the highball bombs. And as you can see, the highballs are actually strewn down quite a steep slope. So if you come away from the chain uh, during the course of a dive and swim uh, down that slope, you rapidly hit 50 metres. But up where the anchor is, and you can see that very clearly on the scan uh, at the top there, uh, you, you will find that's about 32 metres depth. And you can clearly see the chain running through the middle of this particular shot. But an amazing ability with this software to effectively swim through the entirety of that debris field in, in some level of detail, uh, something you clearly can't do in uh, challenging visibility under the water. But a really amazing tool. The other interesting thing about this is you can see very clearly this indentation on the bottom, which is where one of the highballs was lifted from. And in fact, also, the dive we did on the video earlier, swimming along the anchor chain and out to the side charge, uh, you can kind of follow that dive very clearly. And, and this particular feature here is the side charge, which we looked at a little earlier. So uh, an amazing piece of data and a real uh, asset uh, you know, to, to take away from the, the project, being able to show people this detailed view of the, uh, of the particular debris site. We were able to use all of this data to direct the operations of the Royal Naval Divers. Uh, they went down, as you saw, with helmet supply and uh, video feeds back to the boat. We could use all our coordinates to give them some details, and obviously our subsequent dives were also able to be directed by all of this detailed survey data. As the week progressed, we were able to direct our diving operations into areas of interest we'd identified during the survey work. And as you can see in this picture here, we have the naval support vessel, SD Moorfowl, anchored in, in the middle of the lock, awaiting instruction. And in the far top left-hand side, you can see the, the naval diver's boat as well. Uh, and as we travel down the lock, you can see just how remote this is. Very, very few houses. Certainly on the right-hand side of the picture here, there are no houses to speak of on that side of the lock. So now we move into an interesting phase of the operation. You can see the naval divers here in the background. 
at this point in the week they'd used up all of their diving time and so they'd asked us to recover the final pie ball, one of which we were able to do entirely on our own. You can see here there's a rope tied uh, directly to some rigging that we'd attached earlier to the highball bomb itself. And our job here was to take a, a secondary rope down and attach it to uh, the strapping that went down to the bomb and then move this rather larger rope uh, attached to the naval vessel. Uh, undo the, the rather large shackle that was attached to it and go and attach that to the cargo net that at this point is around the bomb. But as you can see, this large shackle attached to the lifting strap, we had to undo this, move it, and take away uh, that particular shackle and, and move it down deeper into the water and connect it to the bomb ready for lifting. So now you can see us removing that shackle, uh, having attached the rope to, to the lift strap, and we had to then take that uh, heavy shackle and the, the heavy hawser line uh, to the bottom of the lock and as you'll see in a moment now we have arrived at the bottom and we're following the, the strapping uh, into the silt that's been stirred up by the bomb being captured in that net and we need to attach the shackle to the cargo net ready for being lifted by the crane. You can see the bomb uh, trapped in the net here uh, and this was quite an exciting dive to see that uh, this was a bomb that we'd identified from the survey data. We'd been down, we'd connected up the, the cargo net, we'd captured the bomb and obviously at this point we're, we're putting together the final bit of uh, shackle ready for it to be lifted. So uh, you'll see very shortly that uh, we then successfully connected it to the support ship and, and here is that very bomb. Uh, emerging from the depths of the lock for the first time in 75 years. <laughs> and of course, once the bomb uh, is on board the support ship and safely stowed inside the IBC pallet, there is the small matter of, of getting that bomb uh, back to East Cheshire Sabbatical Club again. So uh, that was the job of uh, the team of us uh, driving back uh, from Scotland. As you'll see from this short clip, uh, that was the fun, a fun journey as well. He's bound to die. We're going to do what they say can't be done. We've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. I'm East Bound to watch no bandit run. Keep your foot hard on the pedal. Some tell my mind it breaks. Let it all hang out because we got a run to make. The boys are thirsty in Atlanta and there's beer in Texarkana. And we'll bring it back no matter what it takes. He's bound to die. Are we going to do what they say can't be done? We've got a lot well, that was this part of the project complete. We delivered the bomb to the Haviland Museum. And indeed, we are now in the process of delivering the second one to the Brooklyn's Museum. So, all in all, an extremely successful project.